Hey, this is Avi Gutman with another Ask Me Anything event brought to you by QuantReasoning.com. I invite you to join me live next time. We do this every Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern, and you can attend for free by starting your free trial at QuantReasoning.com. If n is a positive integer and r is the remainder when, wait for it, 4 plus 7n, that whole thing, is divided by 3. What is the value of r? In other words, what's the remainder when we divide 4 plus 7n by 3? That's the question. I want to share with you what jumps out at me when I read this question stem, and I'll ask you to let me know in the chat whether this jumped out at anyone else other than me. What jumped out at me is that on the one hand, we have some multiple of 7 within the expression that they're interested in, but on the other hand, the divisor, the factor that they're asking about is 3. And where my mind goes immediately is, is there any relationship between 7 and 3? In other words, is there any interesting overlap between the world of divisibility by 7 and the world of divisibility by 3? Let me ask that another way. If you know that some number is a multiple of 7, what can you say about that number in terms of divisibility by 3? Is a multiple of 7 definitely a multiple of 3? No. Is it definitely not a multiple of 3? No. Can we say what remainder you'd get when you divide a multiple of 7 by 3? No. How about vice versa? If we have a multiple of 3, can we tell whether it's divisible by 7? No, it depends on which multiple of 3. So 3 and 7 don't have any relationship between them in, in terms of worlds of divisibility. And that makes sense, because the greatest common factor of 3 and 7 is 1. They, they have nothing in common. So just to give you a counterexample of that, if, say, we're talking about a multiple of 3 and then dividing that by 9, right, is a multiple of 3 divisible by 9? Well, I still can't answer that, but I can say something. Here's what I can say. When you take a multiple of 3 and divide it by 9, the remainder will definitely be either 0, 3, or 6. So in other words, because 3 and 9 are related in some way, they have a common factor of 3, there is something that I can say about the divisibility of some multiple of 3 by 9. I can narrow down the possible remainders. It's not anywhere between 0 and 8. It's either 0, 3, or 6. And vice versa. If I know that some number is a multiple of 9, what can I say about it in terms of divisibility by 3? Oh, I can say that it will be divisible by 3, right? Every multiple of 9 is a multiple of 3, and the remainder will definitely be 0. So when the two divisors in question have something in common, we can say something about the divisibility. But when they are completely unrelated, I think some, one of you taught me the, the, the term co-prime. Co-prime meaning their greatest common factor is 1. They have no common factors. Then there's really no inference that can be made about the divisibility of one of them based on what we know from the other. And I think that's an important concept to wrap our heads around. And I think that if we do wrap our heads around it, then we can solve this question without pen and paper. And that's what we'll attempt to do now. Just to remind ourselves, there was a piece of free info which said that n is a positive integer. And I want you to keep that in mind and look at statement 2. I'd, I'd like to start by talking about statement 2 first. We already knew that n is a positive integer. Statement 2 tells us that n is greater than 20. Okay. Now, in the context of this question, uh, given what they're asking, how much value do you think statement 2 is adding here? It's telling us that n is not only a positive integer, but also it's not 1, not 2, not 3, not 4, all the way up to 20. But it still leaves how many possible values for n? Infinite. Now, to be clear, if the question was different, if it said, 
if n is a positive integer, is n greater than 15? Okay, if that was the question. Then statement two is extremely valuable, right? Statement two would actually be sufficient on its own if this were the question. Why? Because any number greater than 20 is also greater than 15. So if this were the question, then statement two would be substantial. That would be a substantial amount of, of value. In the context of the original question, I just don't see that statement two adds value at all. And that makes me want to eliminate B, C, and D. Because if statement two really doesn't add any value whatsoever, then B, C, and D can't be the correct answer. Now, to be fair, I can't eliminate B, C, and D with 100% certainty, because I haven't really proved that statement two adds no value. And in fact, I showed an example in which, or a context in which statement two would add a lot of value. But I'm fairly confident that it's not going to be B, C, or D, because I just don't see how statement two is has any use whatsoever in the context of what they're asking. So now look at statement one, and I just want to share with you what jumps out at me with statement one. What jumps out at me is that it's giving me information in the exact world of divisibility in which the question is asking about, is concerned. It's the same one. So this three and this three is the same three, and that's significant. That gives me a fair deal of, of confidence that this statement is going to be sufficient on its own. And just as far as guessing strategies are concerned, absolutely the right guess here is A. And the reason is because it's giving me information in the same world of divisibility that the question is asking about. Now, granted, the expression they're talking about in statement one is not the same as the expression that the question was asking about. There, there is a a bit of a difference there, but as far as guessing goes, absolutely A is the correct guess. Now all we have left to do is figure out how, how does one take information about n plus 1 in, in the world of divisibility by 3, and from that make an inference about this expression, 4 plus 7n, in that world of divisibility by 3. And there's more than one way to do this, but I want to see if I can get any suggestions from, from you guys. So Surajit is saying, well, how do I go from n plus 1 to 4 plus 7n? One way to do it is to say, look, I know for sure that this is divisible by 3. Why? Because 6n is a multiple of 3 and 3 is a multiple of 3, so that's a multiple of 3. And guess what? What, what I need to add to that to get to 4 plus 7n is n plus 1, which statement 1 literally just told me is a multiple of 3. Therefore, the answer is 0, right? If the expression is a multiple of 3, the remainder is 0. When you add uh, multiples, they, you know, that they can remain multiples or something? Yes, and I just want to give you a little bit of intuition behind that so you don't memorize it as a rule. If, uh, if you and I are counselors at summer camp, right? You, you Eric, and, and me, we're both counselors at summer camp. You have a group of kids that you're responsible for. I have a group of kids that I'm responsible for. I'm not telling you who has more kids or how many kids. I'm not telling you any of that. But what I will tell you is that Eric likes to have his kids arranged in groups of seven. And it works out, meaning there's no remainder. That he has a multiple of seven. I also like to have my kids arranged in groups of seven. And it works out in my case as well. For whatever reason, we both ended up with groups that are multiples of seven. Then Eric and I decide we want to have lunch together at camp, but we have to bring all our kids with us. And the question, Eric, is when all of our kids are combined, meaning addition, where we're adding your kids to my kids, can they still be in groups of seven? Would it still be possible for them to be in groups of seven with no remainder? And the answer is, yeah, just tell them to stay in their groups. Like, if they were already in groups of seven, why would there, where would that remainder come from all of a sudden? Like, it, it wouldn't make any sense. Okay. So that's the intuition behind why uh, you know, a multiple of n plus another multiple of n will always be, remain a, a multiple of n.
when I see people memorizing the rule, even plus even equals even, right, if you're memorizing that, then you're missing out on all the reasoning that we just described. And also you're limiting yourself to just this scenario, multiple of two plus multiple of two equals multiple of two, right? But that's true for any number, not just for two, right? Multiple of n plus multiple of n is always multiple of n. So the even plus even equals even, that's just a special case of this much more general rule, which I don't think of as a rule. I think of as just, you know, of course that's the way it is. And I think the summer camp analogy helps to see that. Friends JD is saying, not every multiple of seven is divisible by 14, 21, 28. Correct. Not every multiple of seven is divisible by those. But every multiple of those is divisible by seven. If you have a four digit number, right, and let's say the, the thousands digit is A, the hundreds digit is B, the tens digit is C, and the units digit is D, right? So the value of that number is 1000A plus 100B plus 10C plus D. That's the actual value of this four digit number. And if we rewrite it this way, First of all, can everybody confirm that this is the same value? I am not lying. This is still the same value. I just rewrote it in a different way. And can everybody confirm that this part is definitely divisible by 9? Is that true? Yep. Because A, B, and C are some digits. And yeah, so all of this is a multiple of 9, which means that in the world of divisibility by 9, any remainder you end up with must have come from here. And what's the rule for divisibility by nine? The sum of the digits. If the sum of the digits is divisible by nine, the whole number is divisible by nine. We can even say more than that. Whatever remainder you get from the sum of the digits, that's the remainder you get from the original number when you're dividing by nine. And I have a video specifically on this, so if, you, if you've forgotten this or you want to be able to rewind and re-listen and watch the whole thing, it's uh, just divisibility rules for the GMAT on, on YouTube. That's where I explain this. Uh, but that's kind of the logic that, uh, that Victor used to prove that, yes, 7n will always have the same remainder as n in the world of divisibility by 3. Uh, so, uh, sorry, how does this relate to how 7n is the same as n? Uh, I'm not able to relate that second half. I, I understand this. No problem. So 7n, we're going to rewrite that as 6n plus n. And we're talking about the world of divisibility by 3, right? This part is not interesting. So that, that, this part is analogous to this part. That part is not going to introduce a remainder in the world of divisibility by 3. So any remainder you do end up in the world of divisibility by 3 must have come from here, just like here. Hey, I'm just going to interrupt my own video for a moment here. If you're finding value in this video, please let me know in the comments below and give this video a thumbs up. It really motivates me to keep uploading a new video every day. All right, back to the video. So I'll just show you how I thought of proving that statement one is sufficient on its own. Right, I said if n plus one is divisible by three, seven n plus one is also divisible by three. So where is seven n plus one on the number line? There it is, right? 7n plus 7. This is divisible by 3. There's a remainder of 0 at that tick mark in the world of divisibility by 3. What they're asking about is pretty close. Where would I find what they're asking about? The 1, 2, 3 units to the left. Well, if the remainder is 0 here, and you're moving 3 units to the left, this will also be remainder 0. I'm not multiplying n by 7, I'm multiplying n plus 1 by 7, and I know something about n plus 1 n plus 1 is divisible by 3. A number that is a multiple of 3 will still remain a multiple of 3 when given another factor, in this case, 7. Parth is saying, here's another way to think about it. I know that this is a multiple of 3. How do I know that this is a multiple of 3? Because it has a factor of 6. So this is definitely a multiple of 3. And so how do you go from this to what they're asking about. Like, what's the, what's the difference there, right? If you put them on a number line, you'd say, well, so adding n minus 2 to this point on the number line, if I add n minus 2 to that, I'll get 4 plus 7n, which is what they're asking about, right? Now, I know that this is remainder 0, 
because it's a multiple of three, because it's a multiple of six. And I also know that n plus one is a multiple of three, because they told me that in statement one. Now, if n plus one is a multiple of three, n minus two is also a multiple of three. Why do I say that? Well, look at where n plus one is on the number line, and look at where n minus two is on the number line. They're exactly three apart. So if one of them is a multiple of three, the other is also a multiple of three. So you're starting from a multiple of three, a remainder zero, you're adding a multiple of three to it. This goes back to the conversation I had with Eric about summer camp. The sum of two multiples of three will also be a multiple of three, and therefore the remainder is zero. So yes, that works as well, Parth. Nice. So if they were asking about the remainder when dividing by three, and they told me about the remainder when dividing by six, absolutely I would have guessed that, that it's sufficient. The way I look at it is information in the world of divisibility by six is more informative than information in the world of divisibility by three. If I know your remainder when dividing you by six, then I can infer your remainder when dividing you by three. Let's go through this together for a moment. You're some number, and we're dividing you by six. If the remainder is zero, then you're a multiple of three. If the remainder is one, then your remainder would also be one when dividing you by three. If your remainder is two when dividing by six, then your remainder would also be two when dividing you by three. And what if your remainder is three when dividing you by six? Then you're a multiple of three. Your remainder would be zero when dividing you by three. And what if your remainder is 4 when dividing you by 6? Then if, you, if I divided you by 3, you'd get a remainder of 1. And if your remainder was 5, and then I divide you by 3, I get a remainder of 2. And if your remainder is 0, well, we're back to where we started. So if I know your remainder in the world of divisibility by 6, I can infer your remainder in the world of divisibility by 3. In the other direction, it would only narrow it down to two options, right? If I knew your remainder was 1, for example, when dividing by 3, then if I divided you by 6, your remainder would be either 1 or 4. Looking at what the divisor is in the statement and what the divisor is in the question lets me know what to guess, and my guess would be basically 100% correct. Like I, I can't imagine a GMAT question where that guessing strategy would backfire. Like if the information that I have is at least as informative or possibly more informative than what the question is asking about, it will be sufficient. Even though the expression itself is different. Why? Because we can use the number line to make inferences between expressions just as we did here. They told us about n plus 1. They asked us about 4 plus 7n. But we can make inferences on the number line going from one to the other in terms of the worlds of divisibilities as long as we have, as long as we're talking about similar divisors. And that's kind of the, the lesson learned from, from that question. If you found this video useful, go to quantreasoning.com for a lot more where that came from. You should also click that like button and let me know in the comments below what you'd like me to make future videos about. And of course, if you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and do that and click that bell below so you get notified about future videos. See you next time.